Good morning. Good morning. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. Today's date is July 24th, 2001. Right. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Mildred Fader. Mildred, welcome. We're very glad to have you with us. How do you do? I might add that uh, Mildred's husband, Horace, was interviewed uh, quite some time back. Yes. He was in the United States Army, and I think he also served in the Pacific. Is that true? Yeah. Well, we're very glad to have you here. May I ask you how old you are? I'm 83. 83, and your current address? Is Aitic, Massachusetts. And the current marital status, you're happily married, I yes. know. Yes. Do you it, have children? I have three. Mm -hmm. And grandchildren? No, no grandchildren. Three children. And where were you born, Mildred? I was born in North Smithfield, Rhode Island, October the 16, 1917. And were you raised there for a while? Well, I, I lived there through high school. Then I went into training at the uh, Milford Hospital in Milford, Massachusetts. And I, after I graduated from the hospital there, I went to the Boston Lying In Hospital for uh, a course in obstetrics. Mm -hmm. And after I got my six months training there, I took a job at the One Socket Hospital in One Socket, okay. Rhode Island. And, and, and could, before you go on with that, uh, would you tell us a little bit about your family, about your mother and father? Uh, about my father and mother? Yeah. Well, my father was a machinist, and he worked at one of the uh, plants in Blackstone, which was a cotton mill, and he used to fix the machinery that, the looms that they used to make the cotton cloth out of. Mm -hmm. And my mother was just a home housewife, because we had seven children in our seven. family, and she had enough to do at home. That's quite a family. Yep. And all of you were going, busily going to school, and you were telling us a minute ago right. about your training, and you were you gravitated toward being a nurse. Yes. Uh, why did you want to be a nurse? Well, when I was a kid, I always took care of youngsters. I mean, I love children, and uh, I decided, well, when you're a nurse, you have the experience of taking care of babies and youngsters, and uh, and then I uh, decided nursing was quite a career, or a profession, whichever, and, and they didn't have too many in those days that went into the nursing field. There were very few hospitals and nursing schools. The only one was Boston University, which I ended up at after I got out of the service. Before uh, you went into the service, what other training did you have as a nurse? You mentioned obstetrics. Oh, I worked in obstetrics and in the, the operating room, the surgical nursing, mostly. And when I went into the Navy, that was my uh, specialty in the uh, operating room field and also in the obstetrical department because we had, on the island, we had a lot of uh, Japanese women, you know, mm -hmm. who had babies. And they didn't, their doctors that were there, they had a few Japanese doctors, but they preferred the American doctors and they uh, had midwives that used to deliver them. And we used to, uh, the doctors used to let us take care of some of them and <laughs> some of them we even delivered you know if they were coming. Yeah. Yeah. I have a date down here of July 26, 1943 as the date when you entered the United States Navy. That's right. Tell us what led up to your entering into the Navy. Well when I was after I graduated from the nursing school I uh, worked in a general hospital and they were always telling us that they needed nurses, you know. So I had a friend who was a naval doctor and he uh, sort of talked me into joining up 
into the Navy. What did he tell you that persuaded you that you were going to be a Navy doctor, uh, a Navy nurse? What did he say to you? What? Oh, what? he told me, I was telling him I was, I was thinking of joining a service and I said, would you recommend the Army or the Navy? And he says, well, I being in the Navy, I know what it's like. And, and the uh, naval duty is much different from the Army. And he says, in the, anyway, he says, in the Navy, you have better food and better quarters. <laughs> so that got me interested in joining the Navy. Now tell us about joining the Navy. Uh, where, did you go to Boston or where did oh, you Oh, I went to the Chelsea Naval Hospital mm -hmm. for my uh, physical. And after I passed the physical, I got a letter from the Navy Department stating that I was accepted into the Navy Nurse Corps. And so my first duty was I was sent to Portsmouth, Virginia for well, an indoctrination period. Had you ever traveled before? Had you been out of Massachusetts? Well, New Hampshire and Maine and <laughs> things like that, but never out of state, well, not the West Coast anyway. Did you go by yourself? Yes. Or were with you with uh, other nurses? I was by myself when I went to Portsmouth, Virginia, and uh, they trained us there. I think they sent us there to be acclimated to the warm temperatures, because little did we know that we were going to be sent to the Pacific. And uh, after we went, I was in Corona. Then they sent me to Corona, California. For no, no, no. Go back to Ports. Go back to Portsmouth. Tell us about training. Telling us about oh, becoming uh, a Navy nurse. Oh, in training. What was it like? Well, it was a strict regimen. It was like what the fellows get in the Army or Navy. We used to have to drill, and we used to have to go to classes and learn how to uh, survival, you know, in uh, chemical warfare. Really? And things like that, you know. And also survival at sea, we had to go to the San Francisco Bay and jump off a ship to teach us how to, you know, abandon a ship if the time, if it came to that. Never did, thank God, but we had to learn how to uh, abandon ship and then climb up on the ropes, you know, and back onto the ship. How, how, uh, how many nurses were in your group? How well, large a class was yours? Oh, there were 85 in our unit, and we yeah. were with the Mayo Clinic unit that came out of Mayo Clinic. The doctors were from the Mayo Clinic, and, and the nurses were all, we were all mixed up. We were all from different areas, but we joined that unit, but most of the nurses were from the Mayo Clinic. And this unit was called the Mayo Clinic unit. unit. Right, right. They and these used people to have are from a Harvard Mont unit, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I was with the Mayo Clinic unit. Were most of the people from Minnesota? Yes, around the west, that by the Midwest, yeah. And how long were you at Portsmouth? Oh, I was only there for about four months, you know. And I worked, we worked at the Naval Hospital there while we were getting ready, you know. And then when we went to Corona, that was... Uh, that's, that, in, that's in California? Yeah, that's where we, that's up near San Bernardino in the mountain range. And they had a big hospital there. And most of the patients there were already casualties that came from the European theater and some from the Pacific theater because you know that the war in Europe was more ahead of the war in the Pacific, right? And uh, we used to have a unit for the boys that had rheumatic fever, that contracted rheumatic fever and malaria. We had a unit for those and also for uh, 
spinal uh, column injuries, you know, and amputees. They were all there at Corona that were shipped in from Hawaii, from uh, Pearl Harbor area, you know. Were, was this your first contact with uh, with men the real who had been... uh, casualties, yeah. right? Can and you tell us about that? Uh, what What was your workload? Was oh, it they were, well, work they, all the time? Uh, well, yeah, they, we had about three thousand patients there, between the different types of casualties and the rheumatic fevers and the malarias. And uh, a lot of them were very seriously injured, you know what I mean? Uh, mostly spinal column injuries and gunshot wounds of the abdomen. And they were in the uh, amputees, you know, that lost their limbs. And it was very difficult because the boys were well, they all had pain, you know, and yes. some of them were very discouraged, and they didn't think they'd ever get better. This was about uh, toward the end of 1943. Right. So right. you were maybe treating men who had been at Tarawa? What? Uh, you were treating men who uh, might have been in the Battle of Tarawa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Okinawa, I think. Now Okinawa came it's after It's a little Tarawa. early for Okinawa, yeah. yeah. Well, we got the Okinawans on the island, you know, and the um, we had people from Okinawa and Guam and Saipan on the island and Tinian. Tell us, uh, now you were at Corona, California yeah. uh, with this Mayo Clinic. And it's about the end of 43, the beginning of 44. Right. Yeah. How long were you at Corona? Oh, only about four months. And we got orders. Uh, I got orders to report to uh, Terminal Island, you know, San Francisco Bay to board a ship. But uh, we waited two weeks before we went aboard the ship. and. Most of the girls were bunks at the um, barracks out on the island, but myself and another girl, we were replacements for two that never came. And we were, we were given quarters at the Mock Hopkins Hotel. Oh, really? <laughs> for two weeks, we, you lived, lived, very we well. lived like queens at the Mock Hopkins. And uh, that is where we had to go. and. Uh, we used to have to go down to the health club there to work out, you know, and swim. <laughs> we figured, well, we're going to go somewhere where we're going to have to swim. Evidently. Now, didn't you tell us a minute ago what? that in San Francisco is where you jumped off boats? Yeah, yeah. Tell us about, a little bit about that. Oh, well, I'm telling you, that was an experience because I, I could swim, but not that great. So the guy, I guess he was a Marine. And we got on this little board. They put out a board for us, like, like a diving board. And I got up there, and he says, now, when you jump, you have to go like this, you know. So when you hit the water, you won't break any of your bones. So I said, oh my god. So I got up there. And he says, well, are you going? I said, yeah, give me a little time. I have to get my courage up. And he says, well, he says, you had enough time to think about it. If you don't go, I'm going to push you. I said, oh, don't do that. I says, I'm going to go on my own. So I did. I went down. And oh my god, I went down so far. I didn't think I'd ever come up. I was gasping for, for air. But I finally came up, and I I was kind of dizzy because that was a long jump. And so I swam back to the ship and got aboard. So I passed my test. Yes, you did. Yes, you <laughs> did. So then did you sail overseas from there? From San Francisco. They, they told us to be ready at any time because we didn't know when we were going to depart. And so one night 
they knocked on the door about eight o'clock in a, you know, room. And my friend and I said, well, we have to go. So all we could take was a footlocker with our belongings, you know, things that we would really need. We didn't have to take the uniforms because they were going to supply us with, with, well, island uniforms, you know, warm, cool uniforms. Yeah. And when we got there, we took one set of blues and one set of dress whites in case we needed them for any kind of a function, you know. Well, what was your rank at this time? Were you I a, was an ensign. You were an ensign in the United States Navy. Navy, right. And you, with another, the group of the Mayo group now. Yeah. Did you get on the ship right in San Francisco Bay? Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, it was at well, night? Well, we got, we were taken down in one of those army vehicles, you know. We just had a footlockers. And we all gathered on the shore and they took us out to the ship in a launch, like a LST craft, you know the whole bunch of us, and uh, the name of the ship was the USS Kershaw, an attack transport. So we bought it on that, and well, I'll tell you, and of course we were in the quarters that they arranged for the nurses, because we were with other troops, you know. And um, <clears throat> God, we were in one area where they had three tiers of bunks, you know, on the ship. And I says to the kids, I ain't going up top. I'm on a, a lower bunk because if it gets rough, I don't want to spill out. <coughs> so I got a low bunk, and we put our foot lockers at the foot of our bunks, and we got acclimated. It was hot because, you know, it was on the ships were hot. And of course, they showed us where we had to go for our meals to the uh, dining area and the galley or whatever you call it. And uh, a lot of the girls got seasick. So we put out to sea and they didn't tell us where we were going. Do you, first, do you remember that night? Hmm? Do you remember that night sailing on a ship out of San Francisco Bay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we, looking at the United States kind of fading away. Yeah, and the what Golden did you feel Gate about Bridge. that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I said, well, I don't know where we're going, but uh, some of my friends, they were shipped to the East Coast, and they bought a the ship there, and you know, they ended up in the Aleutians in Kiska. And I was glad I didn't go there because it's cold. And so. When I got on that ship and they told us, we, when we were way out at sea, then they told us that we were going to the Mariana Islands. Uh, do but, you have any idea where they were? No, didn't know no. where the Marianas were from a hole in the wall. We passed uh, Hawaii, you know, on the way, and uh, the ship was a nice ship, but uh, we only went eight knots all the way zigzag so that there wouldn't be any attacks or whatever you want to call it. And um, the, a lot of the girls got sick and some of them were in their bunks for about a week on IV feedings and I said, I'll be damned if I'm going to get sick. And one of the boys told me, Fade, if you want to stay healthy, go up topside take these saltine crackers and look at one spot and you won't get sick. So I did that and I, I got kind of oozed, you know, my stomach wasn't right. And the guys in the, the ward room, they left a seat for me right by the door and they used to take bets to see whether I was going to make it for breakfast the next day. And I said, I'll be there if it kills me. And I never got sick, thank heavens. And it was, it was slow, you know, getting there. It took us a whole month. You didn't stop at Hawaii? You just sailed past no, it? No, we didn't go, we didn't stop at Hawaii. We stopped at Kwajalein and left off some people and, and supplies. 
and we stop at uh, and we talk. Those are the islands along the way. And Bikini, that's where they first tested the bomb. Mm -hmm. And they let us off on the beach there for a while. And it was a beautiful white sanded beach, but there was nothing there except the beach and a few little huts. So, and from there on, it was a slow process getting to that. And when we got to Guam, then they told us we were going to the island of Guam. And of course, I knew it was one of our possessions or, mm. or whatever. So I said, <coughs> well, we got to Guam, and the ship anchored in the middle of some place, the harbor or whatever, and we got off on a uh, LSD. They took the whole group of us with our foot lockers. They dropped us on the beach on Guam, and there was nothing there but woods and coconut palms, and there we sat. And then a truck came and took us over to where we were going. So we were sent to an area that wasn't even prepared for us. We had to sit out there until they put tents up for us. So they put up this big tent. <laughs> and you know how hot it is out there. <laughs> and the sun was buried up. And so we get in the tent. We get a bunk in the tent. There was it was a big tent, and there were bunks on either side and a, a path to go through, and we put our foot lockers down. And we says, well, now what happens? They were building the barracks for us, you know. The sea bees were there, and they were putting up the quonset for us. And after a few days, they, they were pretty fast building them. In a few days, we moved into the quonsets, and there was these little units, you know, in the Quonset, there were two of us to a unit. And uh, that's where we lived. With you, <clears throat> were, were there any friends? What? Uh, were there any friends with you? Uh, well, no, I made friends. You talked about a roommate. Um, oh, well, I made friends, yes. I had a couple of good friends, and I kept in contact with them. I still hear from them, oh, you know? Oh, that's nice. One of them passed away, but I still have three good buddies that are still living, and I, I write to them, and they write to me, and they tell me about their, their lives. A lot of them are sick now, and they're old, you know. But I'm lucky; I'm still able to navigate. <clears throat> Is it possible? Do you know about the date that you landed at Guam? About when it was in 1944. Oh, in February. In February. Yeah, way no before that. It was in 43. I know we got there in, in the fall of 43. No, 44, I think. About the, about the spring of 1944. Yeah, about yeah. then, yeah. And it was plenty hot out there, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, God, yes. The sun would come up at 7 in the morning, go down at 6 at night, just like that. There was no daylight saving out there. <laughs> and it was, oh, it would be anywhere from 80, 90 in the morning, and by noon it would be in the hundreds. What and, was going on around you? Uh, what other units were there? Were there uh, oh, yes. fighting infantry people we had, or what? Uh, we had the bomb squad. Curtis LeMay was there with the bomb squad in the village of Agania at the airfield. And we had fighter pilots that flew F-6Fs, you know. And uh, that was on Guam. On Saipan, we had the marine pilots that flew the F4Us, you know? The Corsairs. The yeah. Hmm? Corsairs. Yeah, the Cor Corsairs, the Corvette, yeah. So, uh, we had... How long were you on Guam now? 
I was on Guam longer than I was on Saipan. I was on Saipan only about six months. That yeah. was when I was on Guam, they were looking for volunteers to go to Saipan to take care of the Japanese prisoners that were interned there. And so I said, well, why not? It'll be a different experience, see what the violence like. And uh, so we, uh, there were eight of us that volunteered, and we went there and we took care of them. That was kind of a scary uh, experience <coughs> because we had Marines that were there and they used to uh, guard us, you know especially when I was on night duty there, you would have this little hut where you sat in that was all screened in, and the light was on, and God, anybody could see you from outside. You were a good target, you know? Mm -hmm. So we used to have Marine guards that used to patrol the area and watch for us, because you never knew what the Japanese were gonna do, because you couldn't trust them. They used to fight among one another and kill one another, you know? And I says, who knows what they would do with us, but they never bothered us because they, the boys had their orders that if they as much as touched us, they would shoot them. And when they were in the hospital unit, you know, the Quonset huts, the Japanese, and they told us that there was a guard on this entrance and the one the concert had an opening, you know, one side to the other. And they had a marine guard on each door. So if if any of the Japanese gave us trouble, they were ordered to shoot them. So they knew that and so they never bothered us. And some of them were very grateful that we took care of them because we were human <laughs> compared to their doctors from what they told us, you know. And when we, cause when we were first starting out, we were given, uh, we were taught Japanese. They gave us phrase books when we were at Corona. And we had to go to class to learn Japanese. So after we got those, I figured, well, we're going somewhere where there are Japanese, <laughs> but I didn't know where, so. You and I talked about this a little while ago, well, that uh, Saipan was invaded on the 15th of June in 1944. Yeah. So that's how long after the battle uh, well, did you arrive after, there? Well, uh, we went there during the thick of the war, you know, when they were really fighting. We got there when it was almost secured and they took the Japanese prisoners, you know, Mm -hmm. And also, they took their uh, their people, you know, their families, and there were also the Chamorro natives, you know, on both the islands. So they were also in turn because, although the Chamorros were very friendly and helpful, they were, you know, they were they were captured by the Japanese at the beginning, you know. So they had no use for the chaps, but they were glad to see us. You and I talked earlier about the fact, the, the unusual fact, that there were so many prisoners on Saipan, Japanese prisoners, that yeah. previously they, they had a reputation of uh, just being killed in action, never surrendering. Uh, yeah. A, a, a marine private by the name of uh, Gabaldon. Yeah got the title of the Pied Piper of Saipan because he spoke fluent Japanese yeah, yeah. and went around and literally talked them out of yeah. the caves. Uh, yeah, they were Tell always, us about this, this is a very were, unusual man. They were, they, they, they lived in caves all around, you know. And uh, even when we, uh, they used to steal our clothes off the lines, you know. If we had wet clothes, we used to have to wash our own sometimes. And they did give us two Japanese girls that would do our wash for us and our ironing, but they didn't know how to use a flat iron. 
<laughs> they used to burn all our clothes <laughs> till they learned how to use them. Oh yeah, there were snipers around all right, and I used to, myself and an, another girl, my friend, we used to like to go down the cliffs, you know, when, to see the sun go down at night beautiful sunset and so help me I bet they said don't go down their river again because the Japanese are in those caves and they're watching every move you make but they never they never bothered us did you get to talk uh, to the Japanese prisoners and oh, yeah. uh, did yeah. you get to know them personally yes yeah some of them are nice like I said tell us about that well We'd have to take care of their, their wounds, you know, and dress them. And some of them would be very nice, and they would be very grateful. And they told us that we were much more human than their own doctors. Because their own doctors, they didn't believe in giving them anesthesia or, you know, dull their pains when like shots with Novocaine or anything they would just go ahead with nothing and they'd be yelling and screaming but we were kind of more gentle with them and they would rather have an American doctor look after them than their own. You were trained to go overseas and take care of Americans Oh, yeah, I did. And you wind up overseas taking care of Japanese. Yeah. Uh, were, did you also take care of Americans? Oh, yes. On Guam, I had mostly Americans. I even had a kid from our town that I took care of. And they, do you know, the uh, photographers from the Stars and Stripes, they used to come around and take pictures. So they took a picture of me and John Curran. He was from my town. And I took care of him, and they took a picture of us, and they sent it to our local newspaper, and my mother sent me the picture. Is that from Natick? Yeah. No, when I was living in, in North Smithfield. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So you, you met on the island of Saipan? Yeah. No, I or met on my, Guam? Yeah. He was on Guam, yeah, in the hospital there, and there were, oh, a lot of... I could tell you stories about those kids that would break your heart. There was one little Marine fellow from Brooklyn. He was only 19 years old, and he was shot up. A grenade exploded in his face, and he had nothing but his eyes and his chin. All this was gone. So we had to feed him. We put a tube in his stomach you know, to feed him. He could have liquids and things like that. And you know, he knew the difference between the fluids we were giving him. Like, we used to have grapefruit juice and tomato juice. And he'd say, he would write, because he couldn't talk, so he would write to me. Ike, they used to call me Ike, because my name was Iskirsky, I was Polish, you know. And they said, Ice Kirsky's too long. We'll give you Ike, you Ike. So I had Ike put on my helmet in red ink. They put my Ike. I was Ike to all of them. And he'd say, Ike, don't give me tomato juice. I don't like it. You know, he could taste it, even though it went through a tube. But I was really amazed. And we had some Red Cross ladies with us, also on Guam. And they used to come around and write letters for the boys, you know, to send home to their parents. And evidently this fellow, Danny was his name, he wrote, told the lady to write to his mother and tell him about me who was taking care of him. So she used to write to me once in a while and I'd get her letters and uh, she wrote me a letter. So we couldn't take care of him on the islands because you couldn't do plastic surgery out there because the skin grafts wouldn't take because it was too humid. So 
they, sh they were shipping him to Hawaii, to the hospital there. And on the way, they hit a storm. They were sending him by air. And they had to fly way up high, you know. And they didn't have any way to give him oxygen to keep him alive. And he died on the way home. So his mother wrote and told me about that. You know, the boys, they were really something. Uh, they used to uh, always say, oh, I don't let me die, do this. And I said, well, you know, it's not up to me. It's up to the good Lord up there. If you're going to live or die, I says, we do the best we can to help you. And the worst type of casualties we had were the pilots that were shot down and burned the burn cases, oh, they were pathetic. And of course, they got first preference. And we used to uh, do what we could to make them comfortable, mostly sedate them so they wouldn't have pain, and ship them out by air as fast as we could, you know? So that, and so they would go to Hawaii. And from there, they used to send them to California because even in Hawaii, the humidity was too much for trying to uh, do skin grafts, you know, for burn cases. Mildred, when you arrived at Saipan, yeah. um, you, you arrived evidently after the, the Banzai charge, and there were 30,000 casualties yeah. on that island. Yeah. Tell us what an island looks like that, that has a, a fierce battle like that. Well, there was nothing much left. The, all the trees were shot down, you know especially on the beaches, all the palms or whatever the trees they had, they were all stumps. And all the, uh, the housing that these natives lived in, they only had, you know, these little huts with thatched roofs or whatever, whatever they made them of. They were gone and they were living in burned out places like some of the buildings that they had were burned, you know, bombed out. There was nothing but little structures left. Where did you live? Well, they put up a concert hut for us on the beach. And uh, we lived on the beach, the eight of us. And uh, there was a marine place close by. The uh, Air Force was there, you know, the Marine Air Force. And they were our friends, they were good. We used to go there to eat mostly because they had better food than we did. <laughs> and the the Marines had better food than you did? Yeah, they did. Well, they had, uh, yeah, they had a better quality. We had a lot of K rations and things like that. They did too. But once in a while, the ship come in, they used to have some good food. And when the ships came in, the, the hospital ships, I used to go aboard one of them because I had some friends that were on that ship and I met <laughs> Dr. Danny Hinman. He was an obstetrician from the Lion Inn when I was a student. And I said to him, Daddy, what are you doing, an obstetrician on a hospital ship? He says, that's where they assigned me, so this is where I am. So I got to know him and he, he, he had all, I was, I craved to fresh tomatoes when I was out there. And I said, Danny, do they have any fresh tomatoes on this ship? He says, oh, well, let's go down to the galley and see. So they had fresh tomatoes, so he loaded me with fresh tomatoes and fresh orange juice in a can, you know, because all we had was tomato juice and grapefruit juice. And the water was putrid, you couldn't drink it, it was awful. So that's what we drank. And they, we didn't have milk, so they had canned milk, so I used to drink canned milk. Uh -huh. I got used to liking it. There was a, in Garapan, there was a building oh, which yeah, is a combination Garapan. hospital and yeah. jail. Yeah. And oh, it was yeah. rumored that Amelia Earhart yes. had been a prisoner. Do you know anything about that? Was well, she they there? they talked about it. Some of the natives, Chamorro natives, that lived in Garapan and the Agania village, they said they remember seeing a plane come in, you know, 
and they didn't know what happened to it. They really kept it very hush-hush, whatever happened to her. I don't think anybody really found out. Did the Japanese ever talk about her? No, they never did. They ignored the issue completely because they were asked about it and they ignored it. What happened to the Japanese troops after you fixed them up? Uh, were oh, they the shipped someplace else? The children? No, the, the, the uh, Japanese army, the infantry. What happened to them after they went oh, through they your hospital? Oh, they shipped some of them back to their own country. And because uh, we had the Koreans that were interned on uh, Tinian, and I was over there just a couple of times to visit and see how things were. And, you know, I tried to make friends with the Koreans. They wouldn't have any part of us. I don't know why. Did we ever have any conflicts with the Koreans? I don't recall. Because the Korean War came after mm -hmm. the Japanese War. What did you see at Tinian? What were they doing over there? What was the United States doing? Were they building the airfields when you were there? Yeah, they had the the uh, airfield. Were B twenty nine bomber hmm? had B twenty nine bombers arrived by then? Oh yeah, the B twenty nine bombers are on Guam at the Uganda Airport, and Curtis LeMay was in charge of that group, and I got to know some of the pilots because <laughs> when you try to get a ride, I want to ride in the uh, a B-29, and they said, well, you know, we can't take you guys up here, me and another girl. And they said, well, we'll see what we can do. So he says, come down to the base early some morning, and we'll see if we can sneak you aboard when we go to practice landing. Oh, my God. They snuck us aboard all right, and they stuck me right in the nose. <laughs> and they practiced going over the cliffs, you know, just scared them. Oh my God, that was the, the ride of my life. I never wanted to get into another B-29 after that. How often did you do that, just the once? Just the one time, yeah, because uh, they couldn't, you know, we had to have special permission to go up in one of those, except when it was official and they were transporting us from one island to another. But I'll tell you who was with us on Guam, Henry Fonda. He was one of our officers of the Island Command. And he was drunk half the time. <laughs> Every time you go to his office to get some paper site, he'd drag out the bottle and say, I, do you want a drink? I says, no, I, you don't drink when you're on duty. But he was What, what was his job? What was I he know. supposed to be doing? He, he had a desk job out there. He was a commander. And, uh, and, and uh, what's his name was also on Saipan, Tyrone Power. He was a, He's a pilot. Marine. He was a Marine pilot. So I got to know him very well, too. And he wouldn't bother with any of the girls because, I don't know, I guess he thought that maybe they were trying to make him or something. I was very reserved. And uh, he got to know me, and I used to sit and have breakfast with the most every morning, and we'd chat, you know. He was married then to Anna Lee, and I knew that, and I said, well, I just wanted him for a friend. And we had a few other actors there, Philip Reed, and the guy that played in McHale's Navy, you know him? Remember that series? Ernest <laughs> Borgnine. He was there, too in some capacity. And of course, Admiral Nimitz, he was our commander. He was up there on the island, island command up on the hill. They had the highest point on the island. They could see over the harbor, you know? And we used to go up there once in a while. Your husband was in the Army, and he was in the Pacific, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he was in Ida P. How did you keep in touch with him? Oh, I didn't know him till after I got back. Oh, I'm sorry. Service. I'm sorry. I met him when I was when I came back from the service. I went to work, 
at the Cushing Hospital to take care of the boys, you know, that came back. And he was a student at BU at the time, and he came to work there to learn about certain things, you know. Oh, I, I put him into your life much yeah. too early. <laughs> yeah, and that's where I met him. So then I went to BU also, you know, to, to get a degree in nursing. Okay. So I met him there, and he was from Wellesley, and so we got married. Don't, don't, don't leave Saipan yet. What about it? Mm -hmm. When you treated the Japanese and the, the Chamorro, is it, the people that lived on the, the island? The Chamorro Islanders, yeah. Yeah. How would you characterize the, uh, the quality of the, what service were you able to offer them? How good was the medical treatment you could give them? Our treatment? Yes. It was very good, yeah. We treated them, oh yes, <clears throat> the Chamorro natives, <clears throat> The kids, you know, they all had yaws, these uh, sores, and they all had worms. And we used to line the kids all up, the little ones, you know. And uh, we were wondering how we could get that worm medicine into them. So we put them in a syringe and opened their mouth and squirted it into them. That's the way we had to do it, because they wouldn't take it in the cup. And the, the sores, well, we used to treat them with a, a penicillin ointment that they had sent to us. The uh, supplies were very good. They had a supply depot and where they kept all their medical supplies. And they had, like a pharmacy, you know, they set up with all the medicines that we needed. And of course, they were top priority and they were always well guarded so that nobody would steal them, you know, because they used to <laughs> steal everything that they could lay their hands on. Can you think of times when uh, you had successfully treated Japanese troops uh, in your establishment? Did they go on and help the Americans while they were on the island? Oh, the Japs? Yes. No, no, they didn't. They were very... Uh, they stuck to themselves. They were very uh, cool towards the Americans. Were they put in uh, prisoner cages, kept in uh, their own prison areas? No, they weren't in cages. Is No, they were all in one area that was well guarded, you know, like a stockade. But they had privileges of going outside in their own areas. And the women, the women weren't that bad. They were, uh, the women were pretty human toward us, you know. Now which, which women are these? The Japanese the women. The Japanese. The Chamorro women, they were, they were great. They were yeah. very helpful to us. This is one of the few uh, places where the Marines fought, where it wasn't just a jungle, there was a town and quite a, a lot of buildings there. Oh, well, yeah, they was had a, like the Agania village in Guam, and uh, they had schools and they had the cathedral and they uh, had a little hospital of their own, but they were all bombed out and there was nothing left. And their houses were all gone too. Yeah. So they lived in makeshift little dwellings that they put up from anything they could find. You spoke earlier of being shot at or that there were snipers around. Oh, yeah. And you were kind of afraid of being with a light on and, you know, an easy target. Yeah. Were you ever bombed or shot at beyond that? Any kind of artillery? No, but there was a jet that got into one of the nurses' uh, units where we, we lived, you know, and uh, I don't know what he, he got over the wall, because we had a wall around too, and she yelled and screamed, and I, he would have heard her, but the Marines were right there, and they shot him. 
but that's and of course a couple of uh, nurses from uh, the uh, hospital 18 they were army they were on the other end of the island well two of their nurses were killed by Japs and buried in the beach and the way they found them is they didn't bury them deep enough and when it rained their hands came up from the dirt you know and that's how they found them they knew they were killed are these two nurses from your outfit no they were no. from the, the army outfit and the Japanese somehow got a hold of them yeah, and killed yeah, them. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Because there wasn't anything to do then. There was nothing on the islands except sea and sky and the jungle and the coconut groves. They used to have some pretty good. I don't think they ever had any. They had some pineapple plantations, but they were all bombed out too, you know. But they did have. Uh, wild bananas, little bananas that grew on the island, and papaya fruit, and of course coconuts, they were falling all over the place at night. <laughs> I'd be walking around the grounds from one unit to another. The coconut tree palms would fall, and I'd say, the coconuts, and I'd be afraid. I'd look around thinking it might be a chap or something. Yeah. Um, I, I want to quote you on something that you wrote. Uh, the question was, uh, how much did you know about the Japanese before you went over there? And oh. you wrote, we only knew that they were sneaky. Yeah. Did yeah. that prove to be true did, after you had met them and yeah, talked with they, them? Yeah, they really were. Yeah. Tell, tell how was the Japanese sneaky? Well. Well, I really don't know, but I know that if you would talk to them, or they'd be hiding, you know, and then all of a sudden they'd appear around and you wouldn't know where they came from. You know, they'd sneak up on you. How long were you on Saipan, Mildred? On Saipan, I was there about four months, and the, the U.S. government hospital was there, you know, and they were teaching the, the natives to farm, to plant, you know, vegetables and, and uh, to try to be self-sustained. And they had brought in chickens and, and cows so that the kids could have milk because they didn't have any for their children and we used to supply the kids with canned milk mostly you know and uh, and of course the Japanese all they ate was fish and rice they used to mix some kind of a concoction they called mizu and that was the most god-awful smelling stuff that you could ever spell. And they used to eat that three times a day. They didn't have much of a diet. You were something like 600 miles south of Iwo Jima and I think uh, 1,200 miles from Tokyo. Yeah. Did you think that maybe you would keep going up the chain and that you'd wind up in Japan? I thought maybe I would end up in Tokyo somewhere, but I never did. <laughs> I, I decided after being a couple years on the rock, I wanted to come home. I had enough of, of uh, jungle living and, and it was, the climate was terrible and they never had anything that would fit me. They used to give me shoes that were eight and a half and my size is five and a half, and I'd clump around those damn shoes in the red clay and mud and weigh it down. Making a big impression on Tyrone Power. Mm. <laughs> that, that was not a good impression on Tyrone Power, I would think. No. I mean, and of course, the clothes that we wore, they were so wet all the time because it was so humid. We only had the seersucker dresses 
and those heavy shoes and socks so that we wouldn't get blisters on our feet. How did you finally leave Saipan? On the point system. You okay. had built up enough overseas time yeah. and time in the, in the yeah, service. on the point system. And they wanted me to stay longer and they said, well, if you stay, we'll give you another step raise. But I said, well, it sounds good, but I said, I haven't seen my family in two years. And I was getting homesick. You used, you used the word isolated uh, about how you felt. Yeah, oh yeah, um, isolated because there was, all we had was radio news and uh, that little newspaper that they used to send us, the Stars and Stripes, that's about where we used to get all our information from them. Uh, word and mouth, we used to know ahead of time what was happening because the boys would tell us all the little swabbies, some of them were even better than the officers. We could get more out of them than we could of the officers. Did you get to go home before the war was over? I got home in February of 1946, yes. I, after the war, because I know when I was on, I came back to Guam from Saipan, and uh, the war happened in August of 46, right? 45. 45, yeah, 45. And President Roosevelt died, right? Yes, in April. Yeah, and I said, oh God, now that President Roosevelt died, we'll be here forever, I figured. And I says, well, and then I knew, we, all, we knew that something big was going to happen because the B-29 bombers Pilots told us everything was quiet and they were getting ready to drop the bomb in Tokyo. But nobody knew, you know, it was a, the, even the pilots didn't know themselves. They were sent to Tillian where they uh, assembled the bomb, you know, and then on to Tokyo where they dropped it. Where were you when this happened? I was on Guam, yeah. And after that, when they dropped the bomb, well, all the girls said, oh, well, we'll be going home soon. You know, the war is going to be over. And so, well, it was over in uh, August of 45, but I didn't get home till February of 46. What did you do in the meantime, Mildred? take care of the patients. Yeah. They were still there. They would send us some stragglers from various different little areas that they were still fighting around there. We had some guys that were there from the China-Burma-India campaign, pilots, you know, that flew out there. And uh, Can you and, think back to some of your patients? You talked about the uh, the 19-year-old who had the uh, tremendous uh, face wound. Can you think of others that you knew and got to know? Uh, did you ever hear from them after the war? Uh, only from Danny's mother, the one that had that died head. in the plane. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. I never. Well, no, I did hear from another Navy. Swabby, who who was injured, and he, I got to see him at Cushing. He he ended up at Cushing, and he was badly injured. He mm -hmm. he was an amputee, and oh, of course, a lot of the patients when I came back at Cushing, they were uh, paraplegics, you know. They were difficult patients to ha handle because they had pain and they always wanted drugs and we, some of them were addicted, you know, and we couldn't give them more than what was allotted them. And they used to get real mad at us, but there was nothing you could do except follow orders. When you first came home, 
back to uh, the States, back to Massachusetts. Did you talk to your family about what you'd done, what you'd seen? Yes, I did. I told them some of my experiences. But coming back was tough because I decided when I flew back from uh, California, I had to go to the San Diego Naval Base to the hospital there to get separated from the service. And I said, well, they said, well, you can go with the Naval Air Transport Service if you can get a ride on one of those planes home. Well, I, I went to the airport and I waited and waited. And they came around about midnight one night. They said, well, we got a flight for you. You want to go? I, he said, pack up. So I went. They dropped me off at Amarillo, Texas. I was bumped by a commander. <laughs> so I sat in Amarillo, which was a little strip in God's forgotten country. <laughs> and sat there for four hours. They said, another plane will be coming by. <laughs> and I got on that, and I finally flew to Chicago. And when I got off at Chicago, I said, the hell with that. I'm going to take the train home right. for the rest <laughs> of the way. So that's what I did. And I got home to Boston. And then from Boston, I got home to Providence, because that was where the train s stopped, and my sister picked me up at the station in Rhode Island. And that was the end of the United States Navy? Yeah. One of the questions that uh, you've been thinking about, uh, a most memorable character or person that you met while you were in the service, can you tell us about that? Well, that would have been Danny, the guy that had his face shot off. He, he comes to mind, but then I also had another young fellow who was uh, a gunshot wound of the spinal column, and he was very bad off, and he's the one that begged me not to let him die, and I felt so sorry for the poor man because he was only a 19-year-old kid, and the priest was there giving him the last rites. And there wasn't anything that we could do. He passed away. That was another memorable thing. You also uh, spoke of your unit leader as somebody you remembered for a long time. Who was in charge of your unit that... Uh, Who was in charge of what? Your unit. Oh, we had a head nurse. Her name was Miss Krause, and she was from Wisconsin. And she was really very strict, you know. She was regular GI and made sure that we uh, followed all her rules and instructions. And she wanted, she, she kept a good unit. She kept us well in hand. A tight ship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we uh, asked you about the most humorous experience, or one? Uh, that was when we landed on Guam, and we had to go to the bathroom. And they told us, well, when you go to the bathroom, you can't go by yourself. You have to go in the buddy system. So I says to Helen Vance, one of my friends, I says, Helen, come with me. And she held my hand. And we walked to this latrine. <laughs> well, it was so damn, the holes were so big, you could have fallen through. <laughs> and I said, Helen, hold my hand. I'm afraid I'm going to fall through. <laughs> and, and that was really the funniest experience. We just laughed ourselves. And she said, we better shut up, because you never know who's lurking around in the woods. So we got out of there in a hurry, but that was our bathroom, and then the showers were, they hooked up cold showers <laughs> from, from ocean, ocean water. Good salt water shower, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it was awful, but we survived. You were discharged on June 30th, 1946. Yeah. Uh, with, what was your rank? 
Lieutenant Junior Grade. And what decorations did you have? Oh, I, I put them down there. I had the Pacific Theatre ribbon, uh, the Commendation ribbon, and the Victory ribbon. And my husband says, I got a few more, but I can't remember. He's got all the ribbons in the box, but I don't know what they were for. But they were. Did you join a reserve unit when you got home? Yes, I stayed in the reserves for 12 years because of, well, then I had kids. And I says, well, I have three kids now. They won't want me in the reserves anymore, but I should have kept the damn rank. But I gave it up. I said, I told them I was married now and I had three children and I couldn't see where I would be of any value to them anymore, so I quit. But my husband said that was the dumbest thing he could have done. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's hmm? his point of view. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you join any uh, veterans organizations when yes, you came I home? Yes, I belonged to the VFW and Natick, the American Legion, and the AMVETS in Natick. And I'm the, I'm the post-surgeon at the VFW. Are you really? Yeah, that's my rank <laughs> Good for now. you. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, it was very important because I felt that uh, I could have been some use in the uh, nursing service and be of some use to help the injured, you know, to relieve some of their fears and their t aches and pains and, and moral support. Yeah. You went into the service with the very high patriotic reasons Yes. for going in, which you've expressed to us. Oh, I certainly did. At, at any time while you were in the service or uh, overseas, did that point of view change? Did you look at why you were there and wonder about it? Or did your um, initial feelings hold up? Well, yes, I did. I, I uh, often thought of how lucky we were back home that we didn't have all the anguish and all the uh, misery that goes on in different parts of the world and the people that lived in those islands. They didn't have the freedom that we had. And I figured I was very lucky to be an American. Did you feel that, uh, Mildred, there's a difference between the way you were received when you came home, uh, back to the Massachusetts and United States, and the way other service personnel have been treated uh, when they came home. Yeah, well, yes, I, I, when I came back home, I was well received by my family and friends, and they thought it was great that I was able to go and serve in the service and come back and have a good attitude about it. Whereas, like some of the veterans in the past were very disgruntled with the treatment they got, you know? <laughs> like the Vietnam veterans and the Korean veterans, some of them weren't too pleased from what I hear, you know, with the treatment they got. But I was always well respected for my, uh, on my return by my friends and the community where I lived, because they were all uh, very uh, helpful in the war effort, you know. Yes. You had a long career in the United States Navy and served a lot of time overseas under very rough conditions. Yeah, yeah. Is there one thought or one incident above all that occasionally comes to your mind that stands out about those years? 
Well, uh, I felt that I wasn't able to do the things that I might have done if I had been back in the States, you know. But I never felt that I was deprived of anything because I was in the service. Because if you want to make something yourself, no matter where you are, you're going to do it. That's true. Is there anything that I haven't asked you here today that you'd like to talk about? Is there one thing that you'd like to put onto this tape for your family or for people who will be looking at this tape a, a, a long time from now? Well, it's a toughie. Well, I feel that whenever there's any kind of a conflict, that it's up to each individual to try to make the best of it by doing what they can to help the effort. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. Mildred, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming in today. You're welcome.